what I'll be talking about today are, is some of the initial work that our lab group has done on differential fermentation of fibers by dogs and cats. I think that if you've been sitting in the last two days of the symposium, you're aware that the microbiome plays a vital role in gastrointestinal health of dogs and cats. It's comprised of a diverse population of bacteria that can factor into both health and disease. Both beneficial and commensal bacteria present in the GI tract protect against infection and pathogen colonization um, and, co and pathogen colonization, excuse me, via competitive exclusion. This function is particularly important during physiological stressors for our pets. That can be things like boarding or traveling, changes in the diet and exercise. One of the ways that we can manipulate the microbiome and make it more healthy is through the addition of dietary fibers or prebiotics. Prebiotics are non-digestible ingredients that beneficially affect the host by stimulating the growth of beneficial bacteria in the colon. This confers a health benefit to both the dog and the cat. This has been studied for many, many years. The majority of prebiotics that are found in pet food are fermentable dietary fibers of plant origin. Whereas dietary fibers are structural and storage carbohydrates that are found in plants and fungi. It's important to know that not all dietary fibers are fermentable, so they may not have these prebiotic type benefits. And one prebiotic may not be the same as the other. There can be slowly, moderately, uh, quickly digestible or fermentable prebiotics that can confer their benefits. Prebiotics and fermentable fibers are resistant to digestion and absorption in the upper gastrointestinal tract and arrive in the large intestine relatively intact. These substrates are then fermented by sacroletic intestinal bacteria, such as lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, which stimulate the growth of these beneficial microbes. We know that for the host, in this case, the dog or the cat, altering the microbiome composition can provide several beneficial effects. Fermentation lowers intestinal pH and this more acidic environment is more favorable to sacrolytic bacteria that are considered beneficial. Again, the, great, the classic examples are bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. Prebiotic fiber can uh, result in the fermentation of, or the fermentation that can result in the production of beneficial short chain fatty acids like acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And these metabolites of fermentation like the short chain fatty acids and lactic acid can lower the interluminal pH, what can which can result in an inhospitable environment for proteolytic pathogenic bacteria. This can lead to a reduction in protein fermentation and then the production of protein catabolites, which can be detrimental to the host. Finally, prebiotics and fermentable fibers are associated with priming the immune system as beneficial and commensal bacteria can interact with the gut associated lymphoid tissue. This leaves the pet more likely to be able to quickly respond to pathogens in times of stress, like I'd mentioned earlier. The effects of fermentable fiber and prebiotics in the diet can be variable, however, and there's many reasons for this. Uh, the microbiome of pets changes due to age and health status, and this can result in a more dysbiotic microbiome. The core microbiome composition is impacted by these changes in physiological state and that can affect the ability of a pet to be able to ferment prebiotics or fermentable fibers. Different bacteria in the microbiome may be affected by the presence of the prebiotic fibers, causing differences in the production of the beneficial metabolites. And because of this, uh, the effect of prebiotic fiber inclusion may not be consistent between the pets. You may see different benefits depending on the health status of the pet. Several things can lead to this variation in fermentation activity. First, the prebiotic fiber substrate can vary. Differences in the structure of the substrate, its chain length, the chemical bonds and degree of branching can affect its ability to be fermented by a bacteria. Fibers and prebiotics from different plant sources may be fermented differentially depending on their bioavailability. Secondly, the degree of fermentation can vary due to the diet that the prebiotic fiber is added to. Both the ratio of macronutrients in the diet in the formulation and the diet type, such as dry kibble or canned, can have an impact. The concentration of the prebiotic or fermentable fiber added to the diet must also be considered because in order to impact the microbiome, an adequate substrate has to be delivered to the large intestine for fermentation. 
The duration of feeding the of the prebiotic fiber also affects the health benefits. For example, we typically wait a minimum of 28 days prior to evaluating the effect of including a prebiotic or a dietary fiber. Finally, the intestinal microbiome composition of the pet does actually impact the ability of a fermentable fiber to provide a health benefit. Individual differences in overall microbiome composition and strain level differences in fermentative capability can impact the metabolite production due to prebiotic fiber fermentation. Our research group has been studying the degree of differences in the intestinal microbiome composition and what impact that has on the ability to ferment prebiotic fibers. One area of interest to us was how small changes in the intestinal microbiome of dogs and cats may lead to differential fermentation of fiber and prebiotics. When looking through the literature, limited research exists that has evaluated the differences between canine and feline GI microbiome. And the focus of much of this research has been more on the composition of the microbiome instead of the function. Uh, current literature suggests that the core microbiome is similar between dogs and cats, with more than 95% of the microbiome comprised of the phyla, firmicutes, bacteroidetes, and fusobacteria. Proteobacteria and actinobacteria are also constituents, but to a lesser degree. However, one study has reported that 83 taxa were found to be different between dogs and cats. Dogs had increased concentrations of Enterococcus, Fusobacterium, and Megamonas, while cats had increased concentrations of Bifidobacterium, Fecalobacterium, and Ceterella. Microbial diversity has also been reported to be different, with cats having an, an increase in alpha diversity compared to dogs. Our internal data has also shown a difference in microbial diversity. This is uh, pets that were fed a similar diet and their beta diversity on a PCA plot, where you can see a clear distinction between the amount and type of bacteria present between cat and dog. Based on the literature review and some of our exploratory analysis, we decided to investigate how differences in bacteria composition and microbial diversity could affect fiber and prebiotic fermentation in healthy adult dogs and cats. In order to determine differences in fermentation patterns in fibers and prebiotics, we conducted in vitro experiments in, at a company called ProDigest. Individual fibers and prebiotics that are commonly used in pet foods were selected for these experiments. They were added in identical concentrations to a nutritional medium, and we included blank and zero hour tubes to correct for uh, the, to, to determine the incremental effect. Fresh fecal inoculum was obtained from healthy dogs and also from healthy cats for this in vitro fermentation experiment. Substrates were fermented with their inoculum for 48 hours at 39 degrees Celsius in anaerobic conditions. And each condition that we measured was measured in triplicate. As I said, we included blank and zero hour tubes in order to determine the incremental effect of fiber fermentation. And following these analyses, heat maps were generated to determine patterns in fermentation profiles. A brief summary of the results are shown in the slide with dog and cat results on the left. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. And uh, cat's results are on the right. For each condition, the substrate was rated compared to its performance versus other fibers and prebiotics. The best performing are bright green and the worst performing are red. Now keep in mind, this doesn't mean that the absolute value is bad, just that it was performed worse compared to the other fibers that we compared it against. For example, when looking at pH production or pH change, um, beet pulp performed the best. That is, it resulted in the lowest pH decrease over the fermentation period, while wheat alurone performed compar comparably worse. The other power with this uh, heat map analysis is that while looking at the columns, you can see how the fibers compared relative to each other uh, when looking at the conditions measured. So we looked at pH, gas production, metabolites, both total short chain and branch chain fatty acids, lactate, ammonium, and then specific bacteria that are classically measured in in vitro experiments. <clears throat> What we can see is that looking at the dog, that there were uh, some fibers, for example, beet pulp and citrus fiber that performed better relatively than other fibers. Whereas when you look at the performance of cats, specific fibers like barley or pumpkin performed comparatively better or stronger in this experiment. 
and looking at the overall pattern of production from the dog and the cat, you can see that there were some differences noted in the fermentation patterns. And this indicates that a healthy dog and a healthy cat microbiome may ferment fibers and prebiotics differently from each other. Another way that we looked at this was through a feeding study conducted to evaluate two different fiber blends. Both our canine and our feline studies were conducted with fiber blends included at the same concentration and in the same ratio to each other. The diets had a similar formulation and contained identical ingredients between the dog and the cat experiment. The fiber blends tested included inulin, psyllium, and pumpkin, and then in, uh, inulin, alirone, and pumpkin. These diets were fed to healthy adult dogs and cats, and we had eight uh, pets per group. And the groups were balanced for age, weight, and breed size. All pets were fed their diets for a minimum of 28 days prior to fecal collections, which is our standard time that we do feed our pets their diets before we look at changes in microbiome. And all pets received a low fiber control and they're allowed a test fiber diet to determine incremental changes. Again, in the respect of time frame that I have, a summary of the significant changes are noted in these tables here using green to indicate a significant positive change in the measurement. Again, canine results are on the left and feline results are on the right. Dogs that were fed the inulin, psyllium, and pumpkin diet had significant decreases in some classically pathogenic bacteria, including Clostridium perfringens, Streptococcus, and E. coli. Fecal IgA, a measure of immune response, was increased in dogs receiving this diet. When you look at the performance of the dogs after consuming the inulin, alirone, and pumpkin diet relative to a low fiber diet, you see an increase in bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. When fed similar diets, no differences were noted with cats when they were fed a diet including inulin, psyllium, and pumpkin as a relative change compared to the low fiber diet. However, when they were fed a diet containing inulin, allulorone, and pumpkin, there was a significant increase in bifidobacteria, and then we also saw decreases in streptococcus. The overall dysbiosis index was decreased, whoops, excuse me, uh, significantly indicating a overall positive change in the microbiome composition. And this is further reflected by seeing a reduction in the protein catabolite branch chain fatty acids. So then we started going a little bit further. Um, and again, very briefly, and we wanted to look at why fibers may be fermented differently by dog and cat microbiomes. In order to do this, we started looking at carbohydrate degrading enzymes or casimes present in these fecal samples. By looking at the functional geno genomic data, we can see what bacterial genes are present to potentially degrade carbohydrate structures. In this slide, we're looking at data from dogs and cats that were fed a similar low fiber diet. On this left figure is the abundance of glycoside hydrolases and polysaccharide lyases. Dogs are on the y-axis, or sorry, dogs are on the x-axis, excuse me, while cats are on the y-axis. And each dot here represents a carbohydrate structure. When the, where the dot is placed on the graph indicates the prevalence of the genes that encode carbohydrate enzymes that are predicted to act on these structures. So if a dot is on this main diagonal line that you see here, they are present in a, uh, similar concentration in both species. So for example, this red dot here, again, if you can see my mouse, are the red dot further over by the 15 by the, uh, on closer to the cat, indicates that this carbohydrate structure has, that there are genes that encode hydrolases and lyases that act on the structure are present in a uh, twice, that they're twice as prevalent, excuse me, in cats than dogs indicating again that these hydrolases or lyases may be more present in the cat. While it is noted that there's a high correlation in caseime abundance between dogs and cats, because most of these are found on a similar line structure, we did see some differences in the uh, composition of these carbohydrate degrading enzymes. This is noted with the PCA analysis shown on the right. Dog data is represented in red and cat data again is represented in blue. What this PCA analysis shows is that there's clear separation between dogs and cats when looking at the presence of the genes encoding these carbohydrate degrading enzymes. This indicates that the ability to degrade certain carbohydrate structures is dependent on the casimes present and appears to be microbiome dependent. 
So finally, in conclusion, I hope that I've shown you that beneficial bacteria populations can be strengthened with prebiotics and fermentable fibers. And while fiber and prebiotic functionality depends on its substrate source, the microbiome present for fermentation and dietary intervention, the microbiome of dogs and cats does have distinct differences. And some of the initial work that we've done with both in vitro and in vivo studies show that fibers and fiber blends are fermented differentially by dogs and cats. And this could be due in part to differences in beneficial carbohydrate degrading enzymes that are produced by bacteria. So the fibers and prebiotics uh, should be tested in the species of interest to confirm health benefits associated with fermentation because what we see with a dog may not be what we see with a cat. So thank you for your attention. I'd like to acknowledge the scientists and support necessary to complete this work.